This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. U.S. District Judge Jed Rakoff has blocked ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, from arresting suspects at New York State courthouses in a ruling declaring the tactic illegal. The state of New York, through Attorney General Letitia James, had sued ICE in federal court after noticing a 1,700% increase in immigration arrests at New York courthouses between 2016 and 2018. The judge caught some tricky wording in the 2017 presidential executive order that ICE thought authorized them to pursue immigration arrests at state courthouses. In actuality, says Judge Rakoff, it did no such thing. ICE has previously lost a similar challenge in Massachusetts. That case is going to the First Circuit Court of Appeals, as well as a similar challenge in Washington State. Let's see why the judge has ruled this way. So here is Judge Jed S. Rakoff's Southern District of New York opinion and order in the state of New York plaintiffs against ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Recent events confirm the need for freely and fully functioning state courts, not least in the state of New York. But it is one thing for the state courts to try to deal with the impediments brought on by a pandemic, and quite another for them to have to grapple with disruptions and intimidations artificially imposed by an agency of the federal government in violation of long-standing principles and fundamental principles of federalism and separation of powers. Here, plaintiffs, the state of New York and the Kings County District Attorney, seek to end what they allege are the disruptions of New York courts and the intimidation of parties and witnesses caused by the decision of the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, ICE, to greatly increase civil immigration arrests in and around New York state courthouses. According to plaintiffs, not only do these immigration arrests make certain parties and witnesses fear coming to court, but the temporary chaos they create disrupts court proceedings and makes it impossible for judges to do their jobs effectively. Accordingly, plaintiffs here seek injunctive and declaratory relief against ICE's current courthouse arrest policy as set forth in the ICE directive issued in January 2018. In their first cause of action, plaintiffs argue that the policy exceeds ICE's authority under the Immigration and Nationality Act INA, and is thus invalid under Section 7062C of the Administrative Procedure Act, which authorizes administrative agencies to make laws through rulemaking procedures that then the law is actually more like a regulation. In their second cause of action, plaintiffs argue that the agency adopted this policy in an arbitrary and capricious manner, thereby violating Section 7062A of the APA. So we're on an arbitrary and capricious standard. Uh, we're attacking it at that level. In their complaint filed on September 25, 2019, plaintiffs, the state of New York and the Kings County District Attorney sought injunctive and declaratory relief from ICE's policy of conducting civil immigration arrests of aliens at New York state courthouses. Prior to 2017, ICE required its officers to avoid courthouse arrests except in very limited circumstances involving high-priority removal targets. In furtherance thereof, ICE, on March 19, 2014, issued its 2014 courthouse arrest guidance, declaring that enforcement actions at or near courthouses will only be undertaken against Priority 1 aliens, a term narrowly defined in an earlier memorandum issued by ICE's parent, the Department of Homeland Security, as aliens who pose a danger to national security or a risk to public safety. Additionally, the 2014 courthouse arrest guidance did not permit courthouse arrests of individuals who may be collaterally present, such as family members or friends who may accompany the target alien to court appearances or functions. All of this significantly changed after the new federal administration took office in 2017. To begin with, President Trump, only five days after taking office, issued Executive Order No. 13,768, the Executive Order, Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States. The Executive Order, though not specifically addressed to courthouse arrests, directed DHS to prioritize immigration enforcement against broader categories of aliens than those named in prior policies. 
The executive order now names as priorities for removal any non-citizens who A. Have been convicted of any criminal offense B. Have been charged with any criminal offense where such charge has not been resolved C. Have committed acts that constitute a chargeable criminal offense D. Have engaged in fraud or willful misrepresentation in connection with any official matter or application before a governmental agency E. Have abused any program related to receipt of public benefits. F. Are subject to a final order of removal but have not complied. Or G. In the judgment of the immigration officer otherwise pose a risk to public safety or national security. So everything except G is new. Very shortly thereafter, in February 2017, then DHS Secretary John Kelly issued a memorandum, the 2017 Implementing Memo, that once again in general terms sought to implement the executive order by rescinding the earlier guidance on immigration enforcement priorities and providing that the department will no longer exempt classes or categories of removable aliens from potential enforcement. Although neither the executive order nor the implementing memo expressly addressed courthouse arrests, the parties here agree that ICE officers understood the executive order in particular and the 2017 implementing memo as well to effectively remove the earlier limitations on courthouse arrests and mandate broader enforcement in and around state courthouses. The result was a great increase in courthouse arrests, including as detailed below in New York State. About a year later, on January 10th, 2018, ICE promulgated a new directive. The directive largely codified and regularized the change in courthouse arrest policy that was already being implemented by ICE agents. Specifically, the directive expressly allowed ICE officers to arrest in and around courthouses a much broader sweep of aliens, including, among other things, aliens who have been ordered removed from the United States but have failed to depart, and aliens who have re-entered the country illegally after being removed. While the directive further provided that family members or friends accompanying the target alien to court appearances or serving as witnesses in a proceeding should not be arrested absent special circumstances, it left the determination of whether such circumstances exist to the case-by-case -case judgment of individual ICE officers. Even before the directive was issued, however, the number of civil immigration arrests undertaken in and around New York State courthouses greatly increased as a result of ICE's interpretation of the 2017 executive order. Based on extensive arrest records provided by defendants, plaintiffs calculate that while ICE conducted 20 enforcement actions at or near New York State courthouses in 2015 and 28 in 2016, this increased to 161 in 2017, 107 in 2018, and 173 in 2019. The striking increase from 2016 to 2017 further confirms that ICE effectively expanded its courthouse arrest policy in early 2017 in response to the executive order and the 2017 implementing memo and the directive promulgated in 2018 simply memorialized the policy and practices that had already been put into place the preceding year. Plaintiffs here have offered substantial evidence that ICE's decision to expand its courthouse arrest authority impacted litigants and courts in the state of New York even beyond what the numbers themselves might suggest. Evidence proffered by the plaintiffs indicates that substantial numbers of non-citizen litigants, even those who were not themselves subject to these actions, now feared any kind of participation in the legal system, including reporting domestic violence, litigating family court actions, and pursuing meritorious actions or defenses of criminal charges. And in criminal cases, alien victims and witnesses expressed concern about coming forward for fear of arrest. Plaintiffs have also submitted substantial evidence indicating that these arrests, in addition to their impact on litigants, undermined the orderly functioning of the New York courts themselves. Because ICE arrested aliens as they were entering the court for scheduled proceedings, the agency forced courts to adjourn proceedings at the last minute, wasting scarce judicial time and resources. Similar results occurred when ICE failed to produce a criminal defendant for a scheduled conference. Even worse were those occasions when ICE conducted an arrest in the courthouse itself, resulting in complete chaos, as well as physical damage. Finally, ICE further undermined the interests of justice by arresting and deporting criminal defendants who were appearing in court in connection with their own cases, thereby ensuring that those defendants never face justice for their crimes. 
Defendants, however, dispute many of the foregoing characterizations. Although the court is persuaded upon careful review of the record that ICE's courthouse arrest policy has generated substantially the harms that plaintiff claims that defendants have not raised genuine disputes in these respects, nevertheless the court need not and does not reach these factual contentions. This is because the questions in the instant motion can be resolved as pure issues of law, the resolution of which does not depend on these facts. Specifically, as already noted, plaintiffs argue in their first cause of action that ICE's courthouse arrest policy as embodied in the directive exceeds the agency's authority under the law, the INA, the Immigration and Naturalization Act, because that statute incorporates a common law privilege against civil arrest of those present in courthouses on courthouse grounds or necessarily traveling to or from courthouses for scheduled proceedings. By conducting these arrests, plaintiffs argue, ICE therefore violates Section 7062C of the Administrative Procedure Act. In their second cause of action, plaintiffs argue that ICE's adoption of this policy beginning in 2017 and its codification a year later in the directive was arbitrary and capricious in violation of Section 7062A of the APA. The parties now cross-move for summary judgment on both of those claims. It is these pure questions of law that the court now decides. Count one, the party's first cross move for summary judgment on plaintiff's first cause of action. Plaintiffs here argue that the directive exceeds ICE's statutory authority because the INA incorporates the centuries old common law privilege against courthouse civil arrest. Defendants counter that there is no such privilege still extant and that alternatively, even if such privilege still exists, the INA preempts it. The court has already addressed this dispute at great length in its 2019 opinion and order denying defendants' earlier motion to dismiss, and hereby readopts that opinion by reference. In brief, English courts from at least the late 18th century repeatedly recognized a common law privilege against civil arrest for anyone present on courthouse premises and grounds or necessarily coming and going to a court proceeding. During the 19th and early 20th century, American courts, including those of New York State as well as the U.S. Supreme Court, confirmed that this privilege was part of our law as well. These decisions recognize two independently sufficient rationales supporting the privilege. First, to encourage parties and witnesses to attend court proceedings, and second, to enable courts to function properly. As further detailed in the court's motion to dismiss opinion, although this privilege first arose at a time when civil arrest of the defendant was the means by which a plaintiff initiated a civil suit, by the era of Person, Parker, and Stewart, this practice had given way to more familiar forms of service of process. Yet, rather than abandon the privilege, those courts found it to be so strong as to apply even to the far less disruptive process service of the day. And now that immigration detention has arisen as a new intrusive form of civil arrest, it follows that the privilege applies in this context as well. This court further held in the motion to dismiss opinion that the statute governing ICE's arrest authority, the INA, incorporates this privilege into federal law. The court's reasoning, fully elaborated there, drew on the fundamental principle that the courts should interpret a federal statute not to abrogate contrary state law unless Congress's intention to do so is manifest in the statute's language. As they did in their briefing on the motion to dismiss, defendants here again raised several arguments to the effect that the INA did not incorporate, but rather preempted this privilege, but none persuades the court to abandon its earlier conclusion. To begin with, defendants argue that the general presumption that federal statutes do not preempt the common law should not apply, whereas here, there is some ambiguity as to the scope of the common law principle at issue. Conceitedly, no cases at the time of the 1952 enactment of the relevant provision of the INA had expressly held that the privilege applied in the exact context of civil immigration arrest. Rather, as outlined above, the cases in the preceding decades applied the privilege to protect against civil service of process on courthouse grounds and to those traveling to and from the courthouse. But this only proves plaintiff's point. If Courts of that era recognized this privilege as so fundamental as to apply to the relatively small burden of service of process. It follows that these courts would have held that the privilege applied even more strongly to civil immigration arrest and detention. The Congress in 1952 surely recognized as much.
Next, defendants cite 8 U.S.C. 1229E, a provision of the INA that, in their view, demonstrates that Congress intended to abrogate the common law privilege in the context of immigration arrests. This section, read in conjunction with its cross-reference to another section, essentially provides that when an enforcement action leading to a removal proceeding takes place at a courthouse and the arrested alien had been appearing in court in connection with specified types of proceedings including domestic violence, immigration officers may not use information provided by abusers to support an adverse determination of deportability. Defendants raised an identical argument in their earlier motion to dismiss, and the court still finds it unpersuasive for two independent reasons. First, the legislative history that defendants cite does not establish that the enacting Congress contemplated civil immigration arrests of aliens occurring at courthouses. The legislative history explains that the statute's restrictions on immigration officers using information provided by abusers applies at all stages of a removal proceeding, not just the initial arrest. The statute's language about courthouse enforcement actions, therefore, does not necessarily refer to civil immigration arrest, but more likely refers to civil removal proceedings arising out of criminal arrests by state and local law enforcement, arrests which the common law privilege at issue would not cover. Second, as Judge Talwani of the District of Massachusetts recently wrote in an opinion on this same issue, Congress added Section 1229E to the INA in 2006, over 50 years after the original passage of the INA. This is significant. Defendants read Section 1229E as evidence, not of what Congress intended in 2006, but as evidence of what Congress intended in 1952, when it enacted the provision of the INA that grants the executive branch broad authority to conduct immigration arrests. But Congress's views in 2006 are of little help to the court in interpreting what Congress intended in 1952. Finally, defendants rely on a recent Second Circuit case not considered by the court at the time of its motion to dismiss opinion. In the Let case, the Second Circuit held that ICE could lawfully detain an alien charged with importing cocaine even after that alien had been granted bail in his federal criminal case under the Bail Reform Act. Defendants read this case for the proposition that Congress granted ICE arrest authority so broad as to override other laws to the contrary. This, in defendants' view, is further evidence that the INA preempts the common law civil arrest privilege in the context of an immigration arrest. But let is in opposite. There, the court held that the Bail Reform Act and the INA serve different purposes, govern separate adjudicatory proceedings, and provide independent statutory bases for detention. There was, therefore, as the Second Circuit expressly found, no conflict between the statutes. Here, however, there is a clear conflict, a conflict between the broad, generally worded arrest authority of the INA and the narrow state common law privilege against courthouse civil arrest. Let gives the court no guidance in resolving this conflict, leading the court again to rely instead on the well-established principle against preemption of state common law. Finding these and defendants' other arguments unpersuasive, the court accordingly finds that the INA incorporates the state common law privilege against civil immigration arrest for those present in New York state courthouses or on courthouse grounds or necessarily traveling to or from court proceedings and therefore grants plaintiff's motion for summary judgment on count one. Count two. Next, the parties cross-move for summary judgment on plaintiff's second cause of action, their claim that ICE adopted its courthouse arrest policy in an arbitrary and capricious manner in violation of Section 7062A of the Administrative Procedure Act. It's axiomatic that the agency must provide a reasoned explanation for a departure from its prior policy. As explained above, ICE initially changed its courthouse arrest policy in 2017 when it greatly increased both the number and the scope of courthouse arrests, as we saw before, purportedly in response to the January 25th executive order and the February 20th implementing memo. While neither the January 25th executive order nor the implementing memo says anything expressly about courthouse arrests, it is here undisputed that ICE officers interpreted the executive order in particular, along with the 2017 implementing memo, not only to remove the earlier limitations on courthouse arrests, but also to effectively mandate that they occur whenever necessary to ICE enforcement. 
Accordingly, beginning in February 2017, the agency's policy was effectively that ICE officers had unfettered authority to arrest aliens on state courthouse grounds. This change was largely codified in the adoption of the directive in January 2018. Ironically, in light of the ICE agent's interpretation of the executive order and the implementing memo, the directive represented a mild contraction of ICE's courthouse arrest authority, though nothing even close to a full return to the pre-2017 policy. For example, the directive provides that ICE agents should not arrest family members or friends accompanying the target alien to court appearances or serving as a witness in a proceeding, except in special circumstances. The directive also instructs ICE officers to avoid arrests in public areas of the courthouse and in areas dedicated to non-criminal proceedings. But while the administrative record produced by defendants provides an explanation for this modest narrowing, it says nothing about the reasons for the broad change in post-2016 policy that the directive largely adopts. Indeed, if anything, the documents in the record demonstrate some of the problems with ICE's unconstrained authority to conduct courthouse arrests throughout 2017. The administrative record contains, for example, several 2017 media reports about disruptive courthouse arrests conducted under the pre-directive policy. The administrative record also contains correspondence from 2017 between ICE and several state courts in which various state chief justices and other judiciary personnel express concern about ICE courthouse arrests. And those states were California, Washington, New York, Oregon, and the National Center for State Courts. In short, no reasons for the 2017 change in policy and practice, nor for its consideration in the 2018 directive, are set forth anywhere in the administrative record of this case. This is because, as defendants essentially conceded at oral argument on the instant motions, the reason for the policy change was ICE's silent interpretation of the 2017 executive order and implementing memo as effectively mandating this change. That is, in 2017, ICE greatly increased the frequency and scope of its courthouse arrests because it believed the executive order, in particular, required it to do so. In actuality, however, the executive order did no such thing, nor, for that matter, did the 2017 implementing memo. As the court observed at oral argument, the executive order is silent on the topic of courthouse arrests. It merely directs in general terms that ICE must employ all lawful means to ensure the faithful execution of the immigration laws of the United States against all removable aliens and it instructs the Secretary of Homeland Security to review agency regulations, policies, and procedures for consistency with this order. However, for all the reasons previously explained, courthouse civil arrests are not lawful because they contravene the common law privilege, which the INA is best read to incorporate, that protects courts and litigants against these intimidating and disrupting intrusions. Regardless of what ICE may have believed then, the executive order in fact did not compel the agency to undertake its vast broadening of the scope of courthouse arrests. The fact that ICE's leadership may have held its interpretation in good faith is irrelevant. Although courts often defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation of the language of an executive order, the case for deference is at its weakest where the word in question is lawful. To the contrary, by its use of the term lawful, it effectively forbade such unlawful intrusions. It is black letter law that where an agency purports to act solely on the basis that a certain result is legally required and that legal premise turns out to be incorrect, the action must be set aside regardless of whether this action could have been justified as an exercise of discretion. ICE has committed precisely this error. It has effectively offered no rationale other than its misguided reliance on the executive order for its consequential decision to expand its agent's authority to conduct courthouse arrests. Although the directive itself makes conclusory references to the reduced safety risks of conducting arrests in a place where people are screened for firearms and the unwillingness of jurisdictions to cooperate with ICE in the transfer of custody of aliens from their prisons and jails, the record contains no explanation of how the agency balanced any such benefits against the harms of the policies discussed above. Accordingly, 
the adoption of the directive by ICE, as well as the less formal shift in practice and policy in 2017, were arbitrary and capricious in violation of 7062A of the APA. For the foregoing reasons, the court grants plaintiff's motion for summary judgment with respect to counts 1 and 2 and, as a direct result, is obliged to also grant plaintiff's requested injunctive and declaratory relief. Specifically, the court declares ICE's policy of courthouse arrests as now embodied in the directive to be illegal and hereby enjoins ICE from conducting any civil arrests on the premise or grounds of New York State courthouses, as well as such arrests of anyone required to travel to a New York State courthouse as a party or witness to a lawsuit. Clerk to enter judgment so ordered New York, New York, June 10th, 2020, Jed S. Rakoff, United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York. So that is really remarkable that the judge would recognize the Administrative Procedure Act as not allowing such a change without first going through what is basically a due process, a notice and rulemaking, a comment procedure period for the public to comment, and then an implementation of the rule only after making the appropriate either rational basis or, or uh, I forget what intermediate scrutiny is, or um, narrowly tailored to implement a uh, compelling government interest, which is strict strict scrutiny. They have to overcome uh, the various rules of, of altering people's rights. And in this case, an administration, an administrative agency or the Administrative Procedure Act are how administrative agencies come into existence and how they make their rules. So what's an administrative agency? You're giving power to somebody. Uh, the FCC gets a little bit of the executive branch's power so that the FCC can do its whole job and the one president doesn't have to figure all, all that out for themselves. Um, so it's like it's like having a branch of a company or something like that that handles one specific task. So because it's a government, when the agency makes rules, which are effectively like laws, they have to follow a whole bunch of other laws, uh, basically the Administrative Procedure Act, that govern how they can enact regulations, what, what the limits and scope are of the regulations they can enact, how they go about the procedure of enacting those regulations. Um, the notice, for example, no, notice to the public, and then a commentary procedure and a reasoned opinion, you know, reasoned decision, and all that, like you saw the judge refer to here. The opinion here does not repair any already arrested immigration suspects who have already been arrested and deported. It's not like uh, any one person brought this case. This was brought by the state of New York, but it was not brought by an ICE uh, detainee. And so I don't think this order affects anybody from the past, even if they were arrested under these circumstances, which this order is basically saying those arrests were illegal, but you can't really undo that. You're not, the federal government is not going to, to agree to fly that person back in from their home or pre, the, the country they were deported to back to the United States, whatever you want to call it, home country, I don't know. It's just, I don't see it practically happening that already Deported people are probably deported for good, uh, unless you know. And and this policy would really only apply going forward. And technically, this policy only applies in uh, this one case. And I'm certain that there will be consideration for a Second Circuit Court of Appeals appeal, and we'll see how that goes. Maybe the maybe the appeals court disagrees. But Jed Rakoff's a pretty smart judge, and so I, I anticipate that. Um, if it's overturned, we'll have some good reasons to go over at that time. Until then, it looks like there is a standing order now in the state of New York, at least, that ICE cannot arrest you if you are in a state courthouse, uh, on your way to a state courthouse, or a witness, uh, or you know, or, or you're like acting as a witness in a in a, a state lawsuit, something like that. So that's not legal advice, just something you should bring to your immigration attorney if you have, if you're directly affected by this. So that's, I think, really interesting. And uh, I look forward to reading your comments below. Let me know.
And that's our show. Thank you for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite community-supported legal news and education channel. Please consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ljfrench or sponsus.org slash law or YouTube memberships or Floatplane as well. In the month of June, thank you to the following $50 plus supporters, Joe Tyson, Wes Delge, Citizen of the Sovereign, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Jan Gray, Michael Pierce, Daniel Perez, Blackleaf, Benjamin Hightoff, Stephen, Ada, Cute Grills in Your Area, Longreach Jones, Definitely Not Prenda Law, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Josh Baker, Gregory, Rudolph Pressurer Jr., Christian Hellman, Jay Dixon, Ammonite, and Oscar the Prophet. And as we were recording this, I think I see another $50 plus supporter has already sent their money in. It's still June, so we'll add hot grills in your area to that list. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the LED panel behind me. And uh, everyone will appear in the description of the videos and the crawl at the end. Love you all. I'll see you in the videos that drop. Have a good one. Bye. Oh, have you left? Yes, you left the ball. He left the ball. And then this one has a thing. I got the ball, and I got the other ball. That was a good idea. about the e-bike block.